Okay, so uh, for those <laughs> who just met me, I'll remind you again, I'm Rabbi Schneeweiss. I teach here at YBT. Uh, and uh, this is my Chumash methodology here. Uh, that's what it was for this past year. And what we, what we did in this year was we would do hakdamos of Hiroshima and Chumash or anything else that had to do with like helping us learn Chumash. And whether it was, uh, you know, like particular Pirushim, they gave us insight into methodology or like other like, you know, thought experiments. Uh, but we're going to do something different today. But before we do the different thing, before I even introduce it, I thought we should start with a very basic question. And this could fall flat on its face. Okay, so I'll ask it in different ways. Um, what is methodology? Okay. And if that's too like daunting of a question, you could like back into it by saying, what is the purpose of methodology? And if that's too daunting, you can say, what why should I study methodology? Okay, so either of those questions are, uh, are fair game. And it's a question that I ask myself uh, from time to time, just because like methodology has been one of my interests and I find that like my concept of it evolves. So, or hopefully evolves, not devolves, but so what would you say? I mean, just definitionally, it just means like the way in which you do something. Right. The way in which you do something. So I, that's, okay, that's definitely a usage of it, right? So let me, let me reframe the question here. If someone, Gave a sheer on methodology. <laughs> right. so like, what's the subject? Like, biology is the study of like how living things operate, or the study of life. You know, chemistry, whatever. What is the what is methodology as a subject? Yeah. The way in which to learn something. Okay, the way in which learning. So that's the type of definition I'm looking for. All right. So the way to learn something. Yeah. I mean, I guess the way to like something okay good good yeah right the way to think through something the way to think through something okay see these are all like like past definitions i've had of it i have yeah go ahead a systematic um, way of understanding something so here's an interesting thing a systematic way of understanding something so I, I see why you're saying that because usually what we look for in uh Certain rules. in yeah in in any area in any ology is like systems you know or principles right but it is interesting because what if the way to approach thinking is not systematic then I would say that's not a methodology. Oh, that's well, just what if by what if by forward thinking? Very postmodern. Yeah, very yeah <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll tell you like I'll just just give you. I'll, I'll take other answers in a second, but just to give you like I remember, I'll give you an example of methodology um, uh, that also addresses this point. So when I so I don't know how many of you have been involved in like Risker learning. I know in Migdal that's a thing, but I don't know if some of you are introduced. Whatever. So in Yeshiva, I think it was maybe my first or second year of Yeshiva then you know we were first like like getting experience in in defining a machlokas okay right you defining the the, the spar, right so so i remember i was in rabbi manshir who used to be the manaha here and he said if you have two sides of a machlokas you should always start with the side that makes the most sense to you intuitively and why would that make sense to start with then it's harder it's easier it's easier right your mind is already working that way so why don't you just like flesh out and develop the intuition and then go to the other side. So then my Rebbe, Rabbi Moskowitz said, no, start with a more difficult side because if one side is easier to you, then you're gonna be locked into that way of thinking, okay? So you have to break out of that way of thinking artificially by trying to tackle the, the more difficult side. So I went to the Rosh Hashiva Rabbi Chait and I said, I, I presented him to, this, to the two sides. I, I said, which one do you agree with, okay? And he said, they're both wrong, <laughs> okay? He said, when it comes to thinking, there is no such thing as methodology. And that like, I, I think my jaw dropped and I, yeah, exactly, right, yeah, right. I was like, well, what am I doing, you know? So, uh, you know, so, so, so that was the, my first exposure to this idea that like I had been looking for a, a fixed procedure, you know, to follow and, uh, and like, and surely there are fixed procedures to follow. I mean, we're gonna be uh, talking about that today, but like I just, that was my first exposure to maybe some parts of methodology involve like not looking for a fixed method, you know? So yeah, uh, other answers, yeah, John. Um, I'd say just the way of analyzing text. Okay, so the way of analyzing text is actually what we're going to be focusing on tonight. Uh, but as uh, as others have pointed out, texts aren't the only way to learn, and especially with Torah Balpe being Balpe in the past, yeah. methodology was not I confined to text. Text learn, like, written text. Okay, text. Oh, you, sorry, you're an English major, yeah. right? So, so Perfect. text. Okay, what, what's the uh, what's the the uh, the modern definition of text? I, I used to have this at the tip of my tongue when I was an English teacher. Which was last year. Okay, something like yeah, yeah. I mean, because like images can be text, yeah. interactions can be text, commercials can be text. Yeah, Ezra. I would just like to add that every time someone says way, way slash process. Okay, way slash process. That's also good. So, so I'm gonna give you a working definition that I have right now, and this is when I say right now, I mean like on the way over here. I was thinking about it. Um, so 
I think learning thinking and stuff is all good. You know, I'm not against like learning or thinking, but it would be um, the study of the, the principles, techniques, and uh, approaches to, to, ob to attaining truth. Okay, and I'm using the word truth because truth kind of encompasses thinking, learning, other stuff. But I think the reason why we learn or the why, reason why we study text or whatever is to arrive at truth, whatever that is, okay? And also with truth, the other thing I like about it is to, methodology is not just about how to learn ideas in terms of like intellectual understanding. There's also methodology in terms of how to make those ideas real to you or internalize them or incorporate them into the way that you actually like see the world, you know? I include that in methodology. I know not everyone does, okay? So that's, that's our overarching thing. So what we're gonna to try to get from this is that, okay? Is any insight that we can into how to approach uh, truth, okay? So next part is uh, before I hand out the source sheets. So does anyone know the name of the first Rishon to write a book on Gemara methodology or the name of the book? And this is, if you don't know the answer, like this is a very, uh, like inside of the year, it's a very undervalued Rishon or book. Rishon specifically? Yeah, I mean, Time span wise, he's a, he's in the late Rishonim. Oh. Uh, but since he's not like part of the club, then maybe you don't. He's in the art school biography book. He's in the Rishonim book, not oh, yeah. the early Akronim book. Yeah. Okay, good. So I'm going to introduce you to him. His name is a very fun name, Rav Yitzchak Kanfanton. Okay, from Castile, Castile. Okay, which was Spain. He lived from 1360 to 1453. Okay, nice long life. Head of the Talmudic Academy, and he wrote this book called Darfia Talmud. Very thin book. It is part methodology the way we defined it. And a lot of it is, uh, I don't know if you know the Practical Talmud Dictionary, Yitzchak Frank, um, like I'm sure there's other books like that, defining Gemara terminology and showing like how it is used in the Gemara. So it's, it's both of those, it was the first book like that. And um, we are going to read the first paragraph and learn the first paragraph, okay? That's our very humble goal, okay? And um, the, you might ask, well, if this is a homage methodology here, why are we doing, you know, the First paragraph of uh, Darfei HaTalmud. So the, he begins with a mamar of Chazal. Oh, in fact, I can't hand this out yet. He begins with a statement of Chazal that they were asked by the Chachmei Alexandria a uh, series of questions. This is in the end of Gemara Nida in uh, Ayin Amad Beis, okay? And one of the questions is, what should a person do to become wise? Okay, now, unless you're going to say that the Chachmei Alexandria were really obsessed with Gemara, then clearly their question was not limited to Gemara, okay? And the answer that he's gonna give is also not limited to Gemara. So, uh, and I've actually learned a lot of methodology that I've applied to other areas. And in fact, I'm gonna tell you an anecdote just to give you another like methodological principle. So one of the, my, my favorite thing I teach here, although it's hard to pick favorites is Mishle. I teach, I give my Mishle share uh, in the morning before this program starts, 8.15 to nine o'clock. Everyone's welcome to come if you want. Uh, it's early, I know. Um, but uh, so the way we do it initially is we read the Pasuk and we analyze it fully on our own and come up with our own interpretation and then we go to Mepharshim, okay? So I was one, when I taught high school, there was once a, a parent who got angry at that. Uh, uh, he came to me at parent-teacher conferences and he said, how do you think that you're possibly on the level to learn Sukkim on your own without Mepharshim, you know? Mm -hmm. So I tried to tell him like, well, we do learn Mepharshim, but he was like, no, you shouldn't even like, you're wasting time by like, you know? So he said, and it's not part of the Masorah. It's not part of the Masorah that you can like, you know, you know, like think about the puzzle on your own beforehand, right? So I, I was thinking to myself, and then I whipped out my copy. I didn't have a physical copy. That would have been really epic, like uh, like a sheath in the back of my, uh, you know, I, I had a, a copy of, of, the, uh, of the text. And I said, well, Ravitzkoff Kampanton was the first regional road methodology book. And he says, you should read the Pasuk. And before you look at Aim of Arkin, ask yourself all the questions and then answer them and then compare it to the Mepharshim. So what did this parent do? He said, oh, so you do have a basis in the Masora. And I was thinking to myself like, oh, like this guy needs someone to give him permission to use his own mind, you know? <laughs> like it was just such a like, it was such a piece of beautiful irony because in his framework, it made total sense. But I was like, really like nothing changed, like literally nothing changed, you know? And then what, I, what if I told him, how dare you understand Try to understand this Rishon with your own mind. Like you could, you could only learn it without, yeah. Anyway, so that, that's, yeah. Even though it is in Ram, it's the rare occurrence. Yeah, right, right. Okay, so uh, now I can hand out the source sheets without spoilers, okay? Uh, one, oh, no, I can't. Sorry, one more question. So when I said the Gemara about asking how do you become wise, you said, oh, do you, do you know the answer? Don't say it yet, but do you know the answer? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. So, yeah, right? so the, if you don't know the answer, what would you just off the top of your head, okay? Off the top of your head, 
what would you say if someone said, what should I do to become wise? Like, it's such a like point blank question. I don't know how I, I would answer, but like, what, what would you guess? Let's, let's think about the question before we approach this. Oh, and here's another methodology thing. I think I read this a long time ago. Uh, maybe, okay. I think I read this somewhere in Descartes. I'm not a Descartes reader, but I bought a Descartes like when I was in high school. And like, I think I read the first part about his methodology thing. And I think he said, or an anecdote about him says that his practice was when he would buy new books, he would look at the title and like the synopsis, and then he would sit there and for however long it took, systematically think about everything he knew about the topic and then read the book, okay? So like, you know, similarly, like if, if so, if you were writing a book on how to get Chachma, like what would be the central piece of advice? Yeah. Uh, good question. So I'm not going to define it, but we'll contextualize it is whatever the Hoffman Alexandria must have meant by wisdom. Okay. So, so meaning encompassing probably philosophy, politics, ethics, logic, some combination of, of like intellectual abstract knowledge and probably also how to live. So I know it's not that a definition, but that's like the zone, you know? Yeah. Oh, sorry. And one, one more point, just because, um, uh, the answer he's going to give is in line with this is let's limit it to text, okay? We can use a broad definition of text, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, but meaning like, not like, like learning from life, for example, like life experience, learning from like words that are spoken or written or communicating stuff, yeah? Study from those who are wiser than you. That's a great strategy, okay? And in fact, according to Mishle, um, one of the definitions of Chachma in Mishle, uh, there's many definitions, but Chachma is a very multifaceted uh, concept. So there are different definitions in different contexts. In Mishle, Chachma often means received knowledge, which is the starting place for knowledge. So that's good, yeah? Um, Think a lot and have someone challenge your thoughts. Oh, that's very good. Okay, think a lot. We, that's like Michelin this morning, right? Yeah, yeah. And so you're you're actually not far off uh, from the answer he gave. Isn't yeah, that, isn't that a thing in Turkey? I don't, am I remembering this correctly? Is it Hukakam? Yeah. Alone in the Yeah. That is. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. Can I say that? Yeah, you can say that. You can say that. Yeah. So what about this? Okay. What about this? Here, here's I'm going to push the question a little bit more. Ah, okay, right. So, so what? What oh, if determine who is? Okay. Yeah, no, no, no. It, it's definitely, it's definitely part of the endeavor of becoming a Falcon. What if someone said, like, in a distressed way, like, I've been working, like, I've been learning in yeshiva for a while, and I'm not becoming a Falcon. What can I do? Okay, so that this advice still applies, but, uh, but like, like, what can I do? Like, I'm just like, I'm learning Gemara. I'm just like, you know, not making progress. Okay, and, and by the way, spoiler alert, uh, you're all gonna go through this. <laughs> okay, like, getting into ruts is a Thing in all areas in life, but certainly in Kafma as well. Um, and I would also include this under uh, methodology, by the way, of like how to get out of ruts, how to deal with the psychology of learning. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to say what you remember or think the answer is? How does Bava Mitzia? Oh, maybe. I mean, there could be multiple Gemara like this, but. No, so I thought there's a Gemara that said that living through learning Bava Mitzia. Oh, you're saying that's the answer? Yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> Uh, I think I know what you're thinking of. That's funny. Yeah, that's funny. I, that does ring a bell. We, I'd have to look at that and see uh, what the difference is there. So uh, the <laughs> that's a very interesting answer. So we'll have to look at that. So the answer he gives, which I'm going to now hand out the source, his answer is marbe yeshiva, which means increase in sitting. Okay, not the answer you would expect. So uh, pass those around. I think one uh, I included one. For oh, the yes, so that's what Rabbi Yitzchak Kamatona is going to come and explain. So first thing we're going to do is just read the Gemara itself uh, and see the answer in uh, in full. Oops. What is this? Did you get everyone have anyone need one more? Are we got we good? Okay. Got an extra. Got an extra. Okay. So just keep that there in case someone else shows up later. Whatever. Okay. So uh, so this is Nida Ayin Amadeis. What did the person do to become wise? So he said to them, uh, so this is a Yeshua, uh, I forgot who it was already. The guy said to the Chachmei uh, Alexandria, Yarbe be Yeshiva, be my Okay, so it's really a two part answer, but he's going to first, we're going to first focus on the first part of his answer. Increase in sitting, okay, and does not mean like being in Yeshiva, okay, like that's not how he takes it. Increase in sitting and minimize Schora. What is Schora? What's that? Uh, uh, that's with a chaf. Uh, what do you say? Is it noise? Uh, no, although some people would consider it that. <laughs> it's business. <laughs> doing business. Okay. Yeah, all right. Um, so merchandise, okay, doing doing business. So we'll, we'll translate it as business for now, but I think we're going to have to examine what that means. All right. All right. So then they challenged him. Okay, like you said, they challenged him. Amru, they said, 
Uh, a lot of people did that and it didn't help. Very good response. Okay. Always valid uh, response to practical advice. Like you got to make sure it actually works. Sounds good on paper. Ella, so now he answers. It's a strange thing. Ella, rather, Yivakshu Rachamim Mimisha Chachma Shalal. Request mercy from the one to whom Chachma belongs. And who that? God. Shinamar, as it says in Mishle, Ki Hashem Yitain Chachma Mipiv Das because Hashem grants Chachma from his mouth, knowledge, and understanding. Yeah, Ezra? Did he just like throughout his first answer? Ah, the so Lord? that's the question, right? The question is, what's the relationship between the first answer and the second answer? Is So what are the possibilities? Either that they, they disproved them. Okay, either they did disprove them and he's throwing or it out. He's, or he's saying you could ask God for it to work by doing right. that. Or he's saying that in addition to doing this, you also have to ask God um, for, for the Chachma. He's modifying it. There's a third possibility also, which would be a weird one, but we're going to say it just logically. Yeah. Some people need to do that. Right. Is that, that really the primary advice is Marduk be Yeshiva and Yamad Beskora. And when, what about if it doesn't work for you? So then you've got to turn to God for mercy. Right. <laughs> okay. So um, so let's just keep that in mind. Um, and uh, we're going to now focus on just Yarba be Yeshiva. Okay. And what he's going to do is gonna, he's going to give two interpretations of Yarba be Yeshiva. Uh, and then spell out the practicality and then explain the ask God for Kofma. Okay. And I should say, by the way, we probably are going to raise a lot of questions and not answer all of them. And since this, the purpose of this is just to get methodological insights, I don't mind if we take up other questions about methodology as they arise. Okay. Like this is more to open avenues of thinking than to get specific ideas. Okay. That's also my way of saying if, if I fail to come up with any ideas, then like we've accomplished our mission. <laughs> okay. All right. So let, let's read just the first part here. Okay. And then we're going to stop and read it again and you'll see why. Okay. Someone who wants to become wise should increase in sitting. Okay. It means he should, yeah. <laughs> Doesn't mean literally grab a safer and sit on it. Okay. <laughs> Thought you were getting up from your chair to like get a safer. There you go. So for a second. All right. Um, what was that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, be excessive in sitting on a book. Laayin hative to analyze it well. Kilo dialo bapam ahas velobishtein. It's not enough to read it once or twice. Okay. Or if you look at the Rambam, uh, we will we'll look at the Rambam later. I forgot to include the Rambam in this. Um, she ayin adavar hahu pam achar pam. You gotta read it again and again, or sorry, analyze it again and again. Ki b'chol pam she achar la ayin yischadish lo eze davar. Every time you go back and analyze it, then something new will come up. V'zehu ke amruzal. This is what the Chazal said meant when they said eno dome shona pirko kuf pamim lo shona pirko kuf aleph. You can't compare a guy who learns his chapter a hundred times to a guy who learns a hundred and one. Okay. Like, what's the value of reading it more than once? Uh, you know what it is. Like, why do I need to read okay, it? Okay, so that's because the... let's say, let's say, right, I read it's it, I miss nuance. Right? Yeah. Like, there's a nuance in the last show that yeah. I realize. I read it a second time. Even then, he says that it's not enough. I don't understand. If I did, if I read a question, I usually get a new one. Right? Okay, so good. Again, in the Mishra show. Yeah, right, right. We get, we go over it again. Right? Okay, so good. We, <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Okay, good. So, so let's do. We're not going to answer questions yet. Let's let's uh, raise all the questions. So, this, so the main question is really like once and twice makes sense, right? Just experientially, there's many times where you read it once and you miss something. You read it again. Okay, maybe three times, right? But you're really telling me a hundred times, and not just hundred times, but the guy who does it hundred and one is like better than the guy who does it a hundred times. And by the way, what I, we're not going through all these sources, but what I did is in case questions came up that involved the actual sources. Uh, I quoted uh, the actual sources from the context. Okay, to look at that Gemara in Chagiga. Okay, sorry, but uh, yeah, Chagiga, the one uh, uh, right under this one. Uh, so this is even more drastic. Okay, Amar Amar le Barhehe lehillel. So Barhehe said to Hillel. Uh, uh, this is uh, at uh, under the uh, next source. Yeah, the next source. Yeah, thank you. That's easier way to say it. Then under the first line, Mike Siv the Shaftim Uris and Bein Tzadik Larasha Bein Oved Alukim Lasher Lo Avado. So what does it mean in Sefer Malachi? Then it says uh, they will you, uh, they'll go back and see the difference between a Tzadik and a Rasha, and between someone who serves God and someone who doesn't serve Him. Okay, Hainu Tzadik Hainu Oved Alukim. Isn't a Tzadik the same as someone who serves God? Hainu Rasha Hainu Asher Lo Avado. Isn't a Rasha the same who, as uh, someone who doesn't serve God? So what's the difference? Yeah. But I mean, like you can have someone follow this with you know, like a blind follow. Right. But there are lots of good answers here, right? Lots of good answers. This one we're going to read is probably not one you would have said. Okay. Amarle, Avdo Belovado, 
the, the in the pasuk when it says someone who serves God and one who doesn't serve Him, tarvayu tzadiki gemurin inhu. Both of them are complete tzadikim. Okay, so tzadik in Russia, that's actual tzadik in Russia. But serving God and not serving God are both tzadikim gemurin. So you have two complete tzadikim. One of them learned something a hundred times. The other one learned it a hundred and one times. And it's calling the guy who only learned a hundred times someone who doesn't serve God. Okay. Now, Chazal do use hyperbole, but I mean, come on, like that, like that difference. And if you challenge that and say, really? So then you're going to see what he says. Okay. He's going to bring a proof. Okay. That's it. Oh, I'm like, Umishim Chad Zimna Karle Lo Avado. Right, because he didn't learn it one more time. He's called someone who doesn't serve God. So where do you go for good proofs? Donkey drivers. Okay, Amrle in yes. Say ulaman mishuk shalchamorin. Look at the donkey uh, taxi dispatch. Asara parsi bezuzah, chadasar parsi betrays So let's say you 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 hire a donkey to take you one parsa, okay, and then you get and it costs you one zuz. So you get a parsa, and then you ask the donkey driver, hey hey guy, can you take me like uh uh, uh two you know uh sorry. You, sorry, 10, sorry, 10, 10, 10 parts of us. And he said, can you, you take me one more parsa? So he'll charge you an entire additional uh, Zeus, okay? Even though you only went like one, you know, one more parsa, right? What does that mean? Okay, so uh, we don't have to analyze the Gemara right now, but but um, but I'm just strengthening the question here. Is, the, is there really such a difference between learning 100 and 101? So yeah. it's also now making it sound like 101 is a magic number, but it would sound like originally yeah. that you just want to keep learning more and more. So it's like not right. as using those as an example. What if you're going to say you're going to pluck somebody who doesn't serve a shot? Second. You're now going to say that 101 is actually a magic number. Exactly, you right. Stop, and you can stop this. Right. And and if you're going to, if you're going to say the other way and say, well, then, the 101 guy is considered a low avado vis-a-vis the 102 guy. Right. You know? well, it must be that you can stop it off. Right. I mean, it, and we say magic number, by the way, there are, uh, I know this is up to dispute, right? But there, there aren't magic numbers, but if, I mean, have you heard the uh, 10,000 hour rule? You know, Malcolm Gladwell popularized that. I know it's, it's, it's disputed, it, you know, but like, like there are like, you know, there are such things as coming up with numbers for, for, you know, putting in the time, you know, or like, let's say, for example, I remember when I came to yeshiva, I think the conventional wisdom was to m- learn how to make a laning of Gemara. You have to learn a hundred blot. If you do a hundred blot with Rashi, then you're going to be good in terms of learning Gemara. Now it's lot of got 100, but like it's ballpark, you know, or the Gemara says, this is a, this could also be a depressing one, is if you try learning Gemara for seven years and you're not getting anywhere, then maybe Gemara is not for you, right? But it's good to have that number also because, because, you know, it's easier for a person, like I was, I was, you know, very down on myself for plateauing, uh, like in my, like, you know, my first couple of years of yeshiva and, uh, I got discouraged and that Gemara kept my, uh, kept my inspiration, my, my hope going like, okay, I didn't give it seven years yet, you know? Um, so, so it, there, there could be a reality to magic numbers, but I agree with you that I don't think it sounds like that here. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't hear what it said. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah um, I mean, I think the probably bump up magic of this rereading so many times is this idea because it doesn't mean I we I mean I think we're taking for this hours to mean like 101 times like right there like just read it once um not and then you keep reading it hundred times over like right. right there. But I think it means more or less that like you're just in the time of your life you're reading 101 times. Yeah. And this idea that like each time it's a uh, to go to use something from uh you uh you've mentioned before this idea of like the the different you almost said you like you've grown oh, okay good time. okay good so this is another you're answering another question which we really should raise which is what is the time frame for this <laughs> okay in other words i think uh i mean probably you've had the experience even though you're you're young but like as you get older you're going to do stuff just on the partial tashavua right or megillus esther or Haggadah, or something that you do every year you know you do see things when a year has passed because you are a different person. Your mind has matured. Your ideas are different. You know, you're coming from a different place. It's a different setting. So that's definitely true. But what is the time frame? Like, could this happen? You know, Marbe B. Yeshiva sounds like in a particular session. Like, if you're working on a sugya, then be Marbe B. Yeshiva and, and do this, like, read this many times, you know? I read it differently. Okay. I read it like it was a, kind of like a lifestyle thing. I assumed it to be more of like a don't get yourself so busy within your life. Like you've got, you constantly want to get it, can you get up and want to move? And the, the thing is to kind of try and slow down. Your life ah, now. okay. So that, I'm, I'm not challenging that. I'm, I, I'm saying, I'm just pointing out that, 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 you know, um, okay. Did anyone, okay, did anyone else read it either way? Like I read it as like in a particular like session of learning, whether that's 
on the same day or the same week, read it again and again and again. Uh, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, because that's definitely true. That's definitely true. It's coming back to something many times. And that there, I'll bust out the wrong. Oh, I won't bust out the wrong yet. Okay, we, we got to keep the wrong for like those are the big guns, you know. Um, but I will give you a, an anecdote for when we uh, when I did this in the most Im uh, immediate um, uh, the, the small time frame. So. My uh, my Mishle Rebbe, Rabbi Moskowitz, and I started writing a Mishle book. Okay, and the idea of the book was to make a glossary of all the Mishle personalities, uh, and uh, and define it and like create like a beginner's Mishle guide. So we were going through every single pasuk uh, that had like you know the term seal, fool, or whatever. You know, so we started off I think with laziness. Okay, so we took every single pasuk in Mishle about laziness, and we sat down and we we learned it. Okay, so. It was so cool, and like we came up with a definition of laziness. Okay, so then this was in the day when he used to record his uh, his his Torah. So so we were about to record it, and he said, "Well, you know what? Now that we've been through um, the whole thing and we have the big picture, let's go and just like test all the ideas to make sure that like like they they uh, they work out." So we learned through all of them again, and we completely revi revised our, de our 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 definition. Okay, then. We were like, okay, now we can record it. So we started recording, and as we recorded, the idea evolved, and so and it changed, and like we saw mistakes and stuff like that. Then we went back and did it a fourth time. Now I had been in a position, this was like I had been learning for a long time. I had been in a position where I had learned and reviewed. Okay, I had never, within the span of one summer, learned through every puzzle about a topic. Did it a second time, a third time, and a fourth time, and I was shocked by like. I was, you know, I was, I was in disbelief that we would gain anything new in the third and certainly the fourth time, but we did. Okay, so, and that's kind of, I'm not answering your question, Joseph, like, uh, like, with an explanation. I'm saying experientially, it is possible, like, to read something in a very short time span, and and because your mind has been working, like, to see new stuff or completely revise your whole understanding. You know. So it works in two ways. Basically. Yeah. There can be a refining. Yeah. Right? Right. Which is like rather than what the fourth time we Right. Is, right. Or there could be like the simple logic of. Right. You could spawn mistakes. Right. Which you can, right. And so refining can happen. Refining can happen just by going through it and, and just seeing the ideas and seeing if it really applies. And then logic errors and just things can be more just a factor in the thing. Right, right. Um, and then there's also the thing with the, the when you change, you know, which you would think that that can't happen, um, that, that that can't happen uh, instantaneously. But like sometimes what happens is because you are learning a certain area, uh, then your mind is kind of primed for it. And then something can happen to you like a real world example. And then like that changes the way and you like rush back to the safe area. Like, oh, now I know what I'm under, you know, uh, now I can understand it. Yeah. Um, that, but also, like, just more learning. Like, as you're learning, right. you make something else, and then you reflect on that, which is change your previous understanding of the previous thing. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, I got to give, I, I, I'm going to give this dark, dramatic example of this. Okay. So, this happened last Shabbos. So, I was, I had uh, um, bought this for myself as this reminder. So, it says, Memento Mori, you will die. And on the back, it says that you can, uh, you could leave life right now. Like, it's reminding you that you could die anytime. So, I've been literally, I bought this coin and got it on Friday. And I'd been, and the idea behind having the coin was just to like see if it makes me think about it more. You know? So I was thinking about it all Shabbos, okay? And like flipping the coin, holding the coin, thinking about the idea. On my way to Mariv Amote Shabbos, a guy called me over to help, someone called me over to help an old man who was dying. And we had to call Hatsala and I had to like be there and like hold him and comfort him. And I was like, I had been thinking about this idea the whole time, but clearly encountering a real example changed my way of thinking about it, you know? And that was in the course of like one day, you know? So not everything is that dramatic, but you could be learning an idea and then you experience the idea and then you see it from experience, you know? Or another example is like when I was um, in graduate school for teaching, we studied the how to teach. And like the first half of my grad school, I hadn't been in a classroom. And then I taught high, high school 10th grade boys and it was the, the most misbehaving class ever. And I was like, oh, now I get like what they were saying. Like I had only been relating to like the ideas in a very, very abstract way. But then when I was plunged into the circumstances, it was a very different world, you know? Okay, so let's just go back to this and read it a second time now we've been discussing it, okay? And see if we see new questions and new ideas. 
So, um, Harotze Shiyach Kam Yarve Yeshiva. Rotze Lomar Yarve Leishiv Al Sefer Laayan Hetev. You should increase your fitting on the book and to look at it, uh, to analyze it very well. And by the way, is anyone else like bothered by the way it's phrased in the Gemara? Yeah. Yarbe be yeshiva. Like, why not say like, yeah, harbe, like analyze a lot, you know, or yachzor hamid, you know, review constantly, right? And if you look at it, like, yarbe be yeshiva, like, it's such a vague thing and like sitting. Sitting is not the most essential feature of learning. So if we could explain why sitting is the way that it's expressed. Yeah, what what's your standing? Yeah, right. No, sitting means primary. Sitting means it's primary. Really, like you could be thinking about how we're doing, right? Ah. But sitting down to learn means that it's primary. So you're being like Kovea for it. You're you're saying yourself, okay, that's a good and I didn't thought of that. Yeah. Shiva has another meaning. Well. It does mean dwelling. Okay, right, right. Like uh oh, is there an English phrase that is like this for uh no, was, there's no phrase like like live with the concepts. That's not a thing. I'm just making that up. Right. No, but, but yeah, yeah, dwelling with it. Yeah, right, right. Okay, that, that's good. That, that, that's a good explanation. I have I have an, another one. Well, I yeah. the idea of like kind of for lack of a better term, like slowing down, you know, it's like you're yeah, okay. you're moving around, and then there's the, the action of sitting there's kind of like you're you're not really doing much. You're back. Oh, uh, okay. So I was thinking similarly. So I was thinking that um that there, what it's emphasizing is passivity, okay? And not passivity where like you're doing, like where you're not accomplishing anything, but I think there is this tendency when you are not making progress and you're asking around, how can I make progress? You want to be doing something and you want someone to give you like an action or behavior or a procedure to do, okay? And there, again, study methodology, there are procedures, but there is a reality to at certain part points in thinking, to not having that need to do something and being able to sit, okay? And I want to supplement this. And I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not sure to what extent he means this, but I want to show you um, three non-Jewish quotations uh, or excerpts that I think express this very well. One from the the West, one from the East, and one from a combo. Okay, so the one from the West is Einstein. Okay, uh, so this is in the Evolution of Physics. One of my favorite parts of the book. <laughs> in the beginning, yeah. <laughs> I don't know the page number. Uh, in nearly every detective novel since the admirable stories of Conan Doyle. Yeah, okay, good, good. It's a great quote. Uh, there comes a time where the investigator has collected all the facts he needs for at least some phase of his problem. These facts often seem quite strange, incoherent, and wholly unrelated. The great detective, however, realizes that no further investigation is needed at the moment, and that only pure thinking will lead to a correlation of the facts collected. So he plays his violin or lounges in his armchair enjoying a pipe when suddenly by Jove, he has it. Not only does he have an explanation for the clues at hand, but he knows that certain other events must have happened. Since he now knows exactly where to look for it, he may go out if he likes to collect further confirmation for his theory. So if you, again, the more you learn in terms of Svara, you'll, you'll, you'll become sensitive to when are we in fact gathering mode and setup mode, and when is the point where all we can do is think. And sometimes when you're thinking, there is this like tendency to like, like do other stuff, you know? Like I remember again in my my naive first year year of yeshiva, my chavruz and I, I guess, could not face the fact that all we needed to do was think. So we would just look for more mafarshim, you know? As if somehow like like someone someone's words would like trigger our thoughts. But no, all you gotta do is think. And what's, what's going on when you're smoking your pipe or playing your violin? Like what, what exactly is going on? Like you're consciously thinking, but like, yeah. It's like uh, almost a relaxing and like shower thought. Yes, shower thoughts is a good example, okay, right, that your mind is at peace and it's, there are certain intuitive unconscious processes, there's two types of thinking, there's analytical and, and, uh, and intuitive, okay, analytical is when you're doing it consciously step by step, uh, and intuitive is when you kind of let your mind go and, and, and not pin it down, that's like um, Adam, this Adam, that's where the, uh, the non-system comes in, is for intuitive thinking, you know. You mean intuitively analytical. You can be intuitively analytical in the sense that you um, set things you, that you know when to use which mind, right? Meaning you, when it comes, <laughs> when you are setting up the Gemara, you don't just open the Gemara and be like, let's see like what my mind feels the facts are. <laughs> like, no, you, 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 you rigorously get the logic and all the facts. But then when you are, um, in term, when you're doing Svara, then you, you have to be intuitive. And this is another, see, I got it. I feel like I have a responsibility to like help you avoid all the pitfalls I had when I was in Yeshiva. So I'll, I'll give you a, um, anyone go to Rabbi Gober's cheer last night? Okay, so Rabbi Gober 
was my Rebbe in yeshiva. Uh, he gave the afternoon shear. He gave the shear actually Ezra that your dad gives now, uh, but like the, like the new guys. Excellent teacher. And what he would do is he would present his svaras in a step-by-step fashion to show how they emerged from the facts. Now, that as a teaching technique was very good because it helped students to see like, you know, like where they understand where they're losing things, okay? But I mistakenly thought that that's how you arrive at svaras, that you construct them step by step, you know? So when I was trying to come up with svaras, I was doing that. I was trying to construct the svaras step by step. And it took me a while to realize that, no, that's not how you do it. You do step by step when you're figuring out the facts. And you do step by step also for checking the svara sometimes. But the svara is arrived at through intuition, you know? So that's just a pitfall there. All right, second. So I think the answer, I think we're good. Is that, okay. Um, all right. And, and again, the trick is to know when to start playing the violin and when to keep on working on the facts. And like that, that you know, the, you learn by experience and by getting to know your own mind. Okay, this next thing is from Jiddu Krishnamurti, uh, who is uh, uh, from India. He was a, a thinker. Uh, so he's talking about listening, but uh, but this applies also to reading uh, texts. Okay, uh, and this I think is the closest to what you were saying, John. Okay, listening is an art not easily come by, but it is there. But in it, there is beauty and great understanding. We listen with the various depths of our being, but our listening is always with a preconception or from a particular point of view. We do not listen simply. There is always the intervening screen of our own thoughts, conclusions, and prejudices. To listen, there must be an inward quietness. That's what you were calling like the calmness, a freedom from the strain of acquiring a relaxed attention. This alert yet passive state is able to hear what is beyond the verbal conclusion. Words confuse. They are only the outward means of communication, but to commune beyond the noise of word, there must be in listening an alert passivity. Those who love may listen, but it is extremely rare uh, to find a listener. Most of us are after results, achieving goals. We are forever overcoming and conquering, and so there is no listening. It is only in listening that one hears the song of the words. Now, what anyone want to say what they think he means in their own words here? Because it's the kind of poetic. Of the words? That's my big question. You can, is it, is it, is it, yeah. What's the song of the words? Yeah, what is the song of the words? Yeah, Yosef? This is saying, and yet, I think the song of the words is the idea. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that what's a good listener is looking for the idea, not just like, can walk through an answer. Yeah. And looking for the beauty in that answer. Oh, okay, good. So let me tell you another what's story. Yeah, and, and that, that good, good, that good, good po poetic interpretation of the poetry, right? Song is the, the beauty, right? So another, um, a uh, story again involving uh, Rabbi Moskowitz and Rabbi Chait uh, mm -hmm. that they were all, uh, I guess they were in New Hampshire at Sukkot learning Gemara. And like they had this really difficult question and like they thought about it for a while. And, like all the guys in Yeshiva were giving like, um, were giving uh, like Svaras and like they were being shot down. And then like Rabbi Chait came up with a Svara, okay? And it like beautifully answered everything and they lived happily ever after. But they didn't live happily ever after because Rabbi Moskowitz, who was interested in methodology, went up to Rabbi Chait and said, Rabbi Chait, how is it that you got the end of the Svara and no one else did? Okay. And his answer was, he said, all the guys were looking for answers and I was just appreciating the question. You know, um, I was just thinking about the question. And that's the thing is if you go into an area and you are looking for an answer, whether consciously or unconsciously, your mind has a preconceived notion of what that answer is going to look like. And that might block you off to the very answer you're trying to find. You know, the way I visualize it, and this might work for me because I'm just a visual person, is like if you have like a stencil, like a, a, a sheet of construction paper, and you cut out a certain shape, you know, and like you're looking at the world through that shape, you know, you're blocking out anything that really isn't that shape, and you're blocking out, and, and you're only seeing the stuff that you're seeing through the shape. Yeah, yes, it's cognitive bias. No? It is a form of cognitive bias. But it's a little more subtle than cognitive bias because it's like, I guess when people say cognitive bias, they, they usually mean particular cognitive biases. And I, I guess what I'm saying is like any looking for an answer. Yeah, I mean, that's what cognitive bias means. That you're looking, you're only looking for a certain type of answer versus just. Okay, yeah, I mean, it's categories of cognitive, cognitive bias. I'll, I'll, I'll give you that, yeah. Um, I think there is something else though also which is there is, I, and I think this is what you were touching on. There is a certain like anxiety or anxiousness. I have to find an answer. And that pressure can interfere with your intuition. Like, and whether it's because of couple reasons, like I gotta be the first guy to get the Svara, or if it's like, like if I don't get an answer, then like, I'm not smart, you know? Like all of these things can get in the way 
of you actually having the freedom to think. Yeah. Um, and so, so allowing yourself to be relaxed does this. And, does this, and again, I don't know it, to what extent that fits into the Gemara's advice, but what's interesting about it is reading the words over and over and over and over again will, will like anchor you in the words and set you up to try to see beyond them, it, you know, in a way where like you, you're, you're doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And it, I can't, I, I don't know how to, how to frame it. It, yeah, it's not, it doesn't sound relaxing. Right. But like the, the goal is to get it to the point where you are, where they're just like in your mind and can float around, you know, wherever you look, you see the thing. Yeah. Right. Right. Um, an, uh, <laughs> uh, and then uh, the, the, the third thing I have here, which is related to that one is from Bruce Lee. So he's talking about this concept. I don't know how to pronounce it in Chinese. Wu Xin, no mindedness. Um, uh, so he talks about it in martial art, but uh, it applies to a lot of stuff is he says, is making oneself empty. I must give up my desire to force, direct, strangle the world outside of me and within me in order to be completely open, responsible, aware, and alive. This is often called to make oneself empty, which does not mean something negative, but means the openness to receive. So again, that's that the more you are fixated on getting an answer or accomplishing something, you're not open to receive what the words are conveying to you. And the goal, like you were saying, is like to get, you're not trying to understand the words, you're trying to get at the idea in the mind of the Chacham who wrote the words. You're trying to meet with the mind of the, of the of one who said it, you know? So you 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 uh, you have to have that openness. Um, okay, so that's sitting a lot. Okay. Um, and one last point here before we move on to the next paragraph. He says, the whole palm the author line, uh, sorry, he says, don't do it once or twice. What's the Havamina of the guy who only reads once or twice and thinks that that's enough? Like, what is his mistake? Yeah. Like obviously we, we we've said the benefits of doing it more times, but like what is he thinking? If you could like ex extract he what thinks, he thinks. Yeah. No, go ahead. Go ahead. He thinks he's yeah. actively done everything he can. Yes. He yeah, right. Evidently, he thinks he's gotten all he can out of the thing, you know? And this is really where the Rambam in the now we can bust out the Rambam in two places within the Hagdama to Perakhalak. So in Perakhalak, he talks about the three groups of people relating to Midrashim. So there's people who take everything at face value and praise Chazal for it, even though it involves absurdities. There's people who take everything at face value and they degrade Chazal for it. And then there's people who learn Midrash incorrectly. So about that first group, the people who take absurdities literally, what was that? The second one, they're interesting. Yeah, they're all interesting. Like you should definitely like learn this. So the first the first one, um, they, you know, they'll say, oh, Chazal said it. And like, they'll it must be a miracle and they'll believe it and they just won't look any deeper. So you have this line, it's kind of a, 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 a zinger. I mean, there's a lot of zingers in here. He says that these people, uh, da, 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 da. hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh yeah. They think that the only intent in the wise statements of the Chachamim is is what they themselves understand. They're literal. In other words, this guy comes up to the Chazal, reads it once or twice, gets a superficial idea, and assumes that that's all Chazal meant to say. Like that Chazal were only writing like on the level that I think on, you know? But if you're reading the words of Chachamim, you have to realize like, no, they're, they're beyond what you can come up with on your own. So whatever you're contenting yourself with the first or second time, like is clearly not what they intended because they're, they're deeper than that. And this is where the Rambam has the real zinger is at the very end, he goes further, uh, he said, we don't say a hundred times, but at the very end of this, he warned the reader, okay, in strong terms. Uh, he says, almost scolds them, pre preemptively scolds them, he says, um, that I've, I've gone on at length about this. Fine. I compiled a lot of great stuff for Emuna. Uh, Review my words many times. Think into them very well. If your thoughts seduce you, that, and, and make you think that you already understood the ideas, the first or tenth time, God knows that you were seduced in falsehood. Okay? The Al Tamahir Bo, don't be quick to read it. 
I didn't write it like as it occurred to me. Allah Akhar is bonus, the Yushu Hadas, the Yun, the Deus, the Honos, the the Honos. I wrote it after intense contemplation, uh, deliberation, and analysis of ideas that are firm and ideas that are not firm, uh, uh, et cetera. Yeah, in other words, in other words, like the wrong thing, like, like if you, I thought into this and sat in and went over it again and again and again. So if you think that you got it from two or one or 10 times, yeah, God knows that you're, you're lying to yourself. Yeah, John. So my question here is that he refers to it as more of like a mistake on your part, like an actual mistake on the reader's part. I work on just an ego thing. Like their ego is so huge. They're like, oh, look at me, I'm a genius. I can read this two or three times. I can be happy. Well, there are people who do it for ego reasons, but then there are people who, like that poor first group that the Ram said, who just are not aware that there are things that are deep enough to require such thinking, you know? And that's to say that we're all born in, you know, until we're exposed to real Hoffman. Um, but, and, and you're also gonna be exposed to that in terms of like, like, look, we have, Ram has a reputation of being a Chacham, you know? But there are gonna be Chacham, especially in the non-Jewish world, they're gonna encounter where like the first time you encounter them, you're gonna assume that they're not a Chacham. And then you start to see Chachma and Chacham and Chacham, and then you realize, oh, I should think into this more, you know? So, um, so like it's not always out of an overt ego. It might be out of just not really seeing the how high you can go in terms of greatness. Yeah. Yes. Um, okay, that's fine. Interrupt me if you remember. Yeah. So when do you stop? Presumably you're not going to ah, say the same thing. Right. That. You're not going to say the same thing if you're hundred times. Right. So I, I'm glad you asked that. That was a question that I wanted to raise. So how how are you supposed to do this practically, like in implementing this? I guess when you have an idea, I, the thing is that I think you, you well, sometimes you need to really, like, really analyze each word. Yeah. Right. Especially when it comes to, like, raw number. Yeah. Yeah. Like, things are, there's clear intent on what the word is. Right. But. By the way, that's his second paragraph after, not on the sheet, but his second paragraph is analyzing every word. So. But, yeah. Um, but then the other thing you do is that once you've already come up with an idea, you can really look at the words and see, well, does this seem like melodic? Like, does this seem like it really just like goes together? Like, yeah. Exactly. Does this seem like the intent of the Okay, good. So there is actually um, a, I'm going to get back to your question in a second, but um, Rav Pesach, uh, my Gemara Rebbe, uh, had a really good way to test whether your Svara is actually accurate or whether you're projecting is, and I remember he said this in context of Totos. Now this doesn't work for everybody, for all like, you know, Mepharshim or writers, but he, I remember him saying for Totos, like, uh, if you have your Svar for Totos, if you wrote the Totos, would you write it this way? <laughs> okay, and if you wouldn't write it in this exact way, so then something is off, you know? Um, so, so I know you're saying more than that with melodic, you mean the beauty of it, you know, Right. I'm saying like, but like that it fits, that it, it's not where, forced. There's sometimes where it, it like fits, but the thing is, it's just like not right. It just seems like dumb, you know? Right. It just seems like, okay, yeah, you have like, uh, you have a song. Right. right. But it doesn't like strike you. Yeah, it's not a song. And yeah. It's exactly, yeah. right? There's no like, don't see any beauty to it. Yeah. The truth is, we start with something different from it and we put it in and we like, right. Right. Exactly. So you, so if you don't really find that beauty, then you couldn't, yeah, even if it is a good start, you would just take first to see the words of everything. Yeah. Right. Yeah. If it's not like beautiful, then you really have to check what you have to Right. So, so how would you use that though to answer Adam's question of like, like, let's just ask point blank also, like, do you do it a hundred times? Like, you know, presumably not. So, you know, so you, 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 so you're saying enough to get the Svara, but even that, like to get that kind of good Svara, but even no, that, no, like, no, that's not what I'm saying. you know, that's what you're saying. I'm saying you should, even when you do have a good Svara. Yeah. Look over it. Oh, I mean, beyond when you have a good Svara, right. Beyond that. Yeah, right, right. Just because we have, like, because we have a lack of knowledge, right? Yeah. We're not on the level of the Right. Right. You should make sure, right? Like, does this really fit? Right. right, right, yeah. And then if it does fit, then great. Yeah. And then you can come back to it later. Okay, yeah, yeah. So when you're not so, when you don't have your energy as much energy. Right, right. right. And then, because that way you're not gonna have as many emotions tied to it, right? right? And then you can look at it again and say, well, does that really like, right. like really make sense? Yeah. 
and then yeah, that's that's very good advice. That's good advice. Uh, I'm going to give a different kind of answer than the kind he's giving. Is uh, and, and uh, you could you could call this a cop out. I don't think it's a cop out, but uh, I think he's just saying all things being equal, this is what you should do. But in reality, there are going to be lots of things that determine how much time you can or should spend on any given area. So let's say, for example, you're in a gemara here. <laughs> Your rep is going to move on at some point. You know, it's a different part. So. So you can't say no. Rabbi Yitzchak Kampenton says I got to do it a hundred times. You know, like that's not the thing. Or let's say like you're, you you go off to work and you only have like an hour a day to learn. So then maybe this is not a good idea. He he he's really just setting forth an ideal and a warning about the trap of thinking that you got it when you've only done it a couple of times. So yeah. Ideally, I would learn one circuit for my entire life. No, no. So that's what I'm saying is that there are many other considerations. For example, like right. I'm saying, it, like in an ideal world where you didn't have to deal with that other. Yes, yeah, so if you, you were, were one to take it for your entire life. Uh, if you were, well, let's put, let's put it this way: if you were a being who had infinite time, right, <laughs> then you would learn everything a hundred times. Yeah, like a well, hundred times in your thousand. Right. Well, that gets back to our other question, right? Under the line, sorry. Yeah. Cost me a hundred times. I'm not advocating yeah, yeah. not serving God. Yeah. yeah <laughs> Right, so we had that question, right? So I, that's what, I, this supports my I, my answers. I'm saying you send forth an ideal of like the more the better, you know. But there are other considerations that say what you should and shouldn't learn, or how much you should devote to learning uh, particular things. So I have a question on. I mean, because he, he it sounds like you're trying to say like, oh, it would be like this one like doctrine or that, but it's also all interwoven. So when you're learning one thing, you're you buy it. It's not making you have to learn other things. To right. Back. That's the other thing also, right? It's like, like, I mean, unless you want to learn Bhav Matia and just become a Chacham and just learn Bhav Matia, point to most features, there are other important Matsakos also, you know? So like, you know, you have to make time for that as well. That's why, I, in other words, he's not, he's not addressing this from a curricular standpoint. He's addressing this from a habit of mind standpoint, that a habit of mind, break the habit of saying, I got it once I've done it twice, uh, and cultivate the habit of doing it many times. At least when you're done, just have it one. Like, I'm not actually done. I just have to move on because of other Oh, yeah. Okay, good. So my uh, my Chabrusa, who I was preparing this with, had a good uh, mental device that might work for some of you. I actually haven't tried it yet. He said, get into the habit of, let's say you have a page, okay? Uh, and what doesn't matter what you're reading, page, English, Hebrew. You read a page, so you feel like I finished the page. So he said, instead of doing that, feel like you got like a 10% gauge. Like I've, I've read 10% of this, you know, and then do it again. Okay. Now I got 20%, you know, like, like get into the mindset of, of when you've read the, the text that reading the text doesn't just mean like having it, like making eye contact with it and like getting the definitions. It means like really thinking into it, you know, set up something like that for yourself. Um, let's do this. Let's read the next thing and then think about it for either. Uh, I guess I'll put out a survey at some point, whether we want to continue this next week or do something else. So the next thing is he gives a different interpretation of what it means Yarvet be yeshiva, and this one connects to the, the Yimai Beshora. Okay, he says, "O Yirte, we're on the second paragraph of that Yitzchak Kamatzon. O Yirte, ki lo yelech beshoraso uvamasal uvmatano rock Yarvet be yeshiva." So he's saying, "Don't go off into your business and your, your, your merchandise and your business dealings. Rather, increase in yeshiva, yeshiv badad veidom." sit in isolation and be quiet. That's a puzzle from Eicha, which I think he's applying as a drasha, meaning like in isolation from other business dealings. I don't think he means like learn in alone instead of learning the base midrash, okay? Kamoshu Amruzal, lo kol hamar betora machim. Not everyone who, like Chazal say, not everyone who becomes involved in merchandise becomes wise. But Amru, and they said, harotza shiyachim yadrim, harotza shiyashir yasmin. Have you ever heard this halacha? It's a halacha. What does it literally mean? Harotesh Yachim Yadrim. Yachim is to become wise. Yadrim is from Darom. South, okay. So one who wants to become wise should turn to the south. But Harotesh Yashir, one who wants to become wealthy, Yatspin, should turn to the north. So this is actually a, a halacha. I mean, I don't know if it's unanimously a halacha, but it's, I know it's a halacha because I looked it up once, and it's Machlokas Achronim, that if you're doubting Shimon Esrei and you want to become, uh, they apply to Shimon Esrei, right? And you want to become wise, you turn to the south. And if you want to become wealthy, you turn to the north. But the Machlokas is you turn your body to the south, but then keep your face, you know, towards your slime, or do you, or do you keep your body towards your slime and your face towards the south? So they, they take it as an actual halakhic thing, you know? Now, I, I wrote I wrote an article trying to explain that, and I can't find the article. It was a long time ago. But what's the point he's making by bringing it in? Do you think? 
Uh, more than the ninth one. I think you're on the right track, though. Yeah. They're exclusive. They're exclusive. You can't turn north and south at the same time. Okay. Unless like you're, you're uh, contorting this and get your head like yeah. But like uh, you, you can't turn north and south an at owl. the same. Yeah. Right. Like an owl. Yeah. I mean, yeah. <laughs> um, That's why they're white. What, oh yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's Orion. <laughs> yeah, but they're not wealthy. <laughs> um, yeah. So, um, so he's just bringing it. Uh, that's true. Yeah, they got a lot of mice sometimes. Um, but um, the uh, he's just bringing it in to show that you are um, you can't do both at the same time. Now, just just in the few minutes we have, what is the difference? He's saying this is an O year set. This is a an alternative explanation for Yarbe Beshora, uh, Yarbe Yeshiva Vimai Beshora. What would you, how would you characterize the difference between his first approach of Yarbe Yeshiva and this approach? Not even defining as Mahlo, it's just the way he's interpreting Hazal's statement. First one is more like internal blaming, but with this one saying more to the end. Yeah. It's like relative to other things, externalism. And yeah. Things. So this is how you start the learning, not like within learning, just in terms of well, dealing with everything else and concentrating my learning. Right, exactly. So this is like, well, once I'm learning, I'm crazy. Right, exactly. So in other words, the first one was procedural, was procedural, right? That when you are learning, this is what you should do. Second one is how you relate to the activity of learning and saying that like, you, if you're not making success in Kofma, then then it's possible that you're, too much of your energy is involved in your, your, your business dealings. Now, just to end off on a couple of questions, we have to understand why, like energy is a good, uh, um, start, but like we have to understand what that means. Secondly, we have to understand what is Skora. Is that because, is that just time? Like you're working too many hours and you need to cut down? Is it being involved in money? Is it like, you know, there's a, uh, in the Gemara itself, no, in Pirkei Avos, I quote a Rosh Bats down there who says that Skora was really like traveling for work. Like, does that apply to all of our jobs now? What about in school? Like, does that apply to, is it just like anything that's a, a, a time and energy suck? Like, you know, so let's think about that. Yeah. Okay. All right, well, let's do this. We'll stop here for tonight. If you have further questions, uh, you know, then uh, then you can ask, or we can save it for next time. We'll see what we want to do next time. But uh, thank you for, uh, for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Oh.